One of the biggest challenges with any cryptocurrency is how to safely and securely store your wallet backups. Unlike other passwords you have, your wallet backups cannot be reset or recovered if you lose them and if someone else gets their hands on them, they will have full access to all of your funds. Regardless of which type of wallet software or hardware you are using, it will eventually need to be replaced. So your backups are actually far more important than the wallet hardware or software that you are using. That said, navigating all of the different standards and approaches for backups that are in use can be very confusing. So in this video, I'll be running through a few of the main approaches currently available, things like BIP39, BIP39 passphrases, SLIP39 and Multisig. I'll be looking at all of these things, plus a couple of others, as well as having a look at the advantages and disadvantages of each. And if you haven't already done so, hit subscribe, not making stay in loop for content I make to help you find your way in the crazy and hostile environment that is cryptocurrency. So the most sensible place to start and the first thing I want to look at is the standard BIP39 mnemonic. These are generally going to be 12 or 24 words long, though they can be other lengths like 15, 18 or 21 as well. They're very uncommon. They will also generally be in English, though other languages can exist. The wallet support for these is quite limited. If you are just using a standard BIP39 mnemonic, it is not a multi-factor backup. So that means you don't need anything else other than the seed words themselves to be able to regain access to your funds. Likewise, when you are running a BIP39 seed on a hardware or software wallet, you won't need anything else to be able to sign and send transactions. The big advantage of a BIP39 mnemonic is simply its simplicity. The other big advantage is their near universal compatibility. You know, just about any wallet you find these days will support BIP39 seeds. And they generally are very good at being able to detect small mistakes you might make there, particularly if you have a longer length seed phrase, like a 24 word seed. And if your wallet supports multiple cryptocurrencies, your BIP39 seed is going to be the single backup that is used for all of them. One of the biggest challenges with just a plain BIP39 seed is it can be difficult to have multiple different sets of backups that are all kept secure, in that if someone does find one of the copies of the backup, they will have full access to all of those funds. So if you're someone who is using a BIP39 approach for your backups and want to have multiple copies of the seed, you're going to want to make sure that each of those is in a very physically secure location or extremely well hidden. One of the other big disadvantages with BIP39 that I see a lot is that 12 word seeds have an incredibly weak checksum. Though this isn't a problem for longer seed lengths, their checksum is much stronger. One of the other big challenges with BIP39 and how widely it has been adopted is that not all vendors follow standards well. If you have a look over here at walletsrecovery.org, it gives you a list of some of the different things that different wallet vendors do. And this can be a challenge with things like the Cool Wallet that implement things like Bitcoin on a non-standard derivation path, which means that if you take a seed from one hard hardware device and import it into another, all of your funds may not appear correctly. And before I talk about passphrases, I also want to mention one sort of variation on BIP39 mnemonics and that is splitting seeds. Splitting your seed phrase, so for example having a 24 word seed and simply splitting it into two halves of 12 words and storing those separately is a practice that has been going on for a long, long time. It's a really simple way to be able to split your seed up and store different parts of it in different locations, giving you effectively a multi-factor seed. You might have succeeded in making your backup more secure, but you've also made your backup a lot more fragile. One of the other big challenges with seed splitting is you will need to work out how you want to manually break up the seed as well as having to do that manual transcription yourself. Some of the ways of splitting your seed might in fact be perfectly secure for a 24 word seed but may in fact be dangerously unsafe for shorter seeds like a 12 word seed. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is BIP39 passphrases. BIP39 passphrases are really powerful and they not only give you a multi-factor backup, so someone would need to have both your recovery seed and your passphrase to be able to regain access to the funds, but most wallets in their implementation of BIP39 passphrase also require you to enter the passphrase when you sign a transaction. One of the big advantages of the BIP39 passphrase approach is that it does have a very high level of compatibility and is supported by a wide range of wallets. Another big advantage is you can actually add a BIP39 passphrase to an existing uh, standard mnemonic based seed without having to generate a new seed and redo all of those backups. It's also powerful and you can have multiple passphrases, you don't just have to have one. If you're a bit on the paranoid side, a BIP39 passphrase can also be great, removing any trust that you're placing uh, in whatever generated that mnemonic for you in the first place. For devices where the BIP39 passphrase is not saved to the hardware itself, a BIP39 passphrase can also help protect you from potential key extraction attacks against your hardware wallet itself. BIP39 passphrases are also a really high privacy solution that even if someone finds your original BIP39 
BIP39 recovery seed, there's nothing in that seed that actually lets them know that a BIP39 passphrase is being used. Likewise, if someone happens to find your BIP39 passphrase, there's nothing that actually tells the person what that passphrase is, let alone the fact that it is to be paired with a specific BIP39 mnemonic. And just like with BIP39 mnemonics, if you're someone who has a multi-currency wallet, your BIP39 seed phrase plus your passphrase together will be the single backup that is used to regain access to all of the different coins and chains that you are using. One of the biggest challenges with that BIP39 passphrase is it certainly introduces a lot more complexity than just a standard seed. If you have a typo in entering your BIP39 passphrase, basically what you will see is a bunch of empty wallets and no transactions. You won't get an error message, you won't get any sort of thing asking you to confirm that it's been typed correctly. Your wallet will just accept it and show you empty wallets. BIP39 passphrases are also a bit of a challenge in that not all vendors follow the same standards in terms of how long a passphrase can be and sometimes which characters can be used in a passphrase, though things are generally very good on the compatibility front. Perhaps the two biggest issues that I see with BIP39 passphrase and the cause of most of the recoveries that people come to me uh, for help for uh, comes down to either bad user experience, so sometimes users will actually have set a BIP39 passphrase and not realised what they were doing, sometimes they'll get it confused with a device pin or something like that. And secondly, often people run into a lot of trouble because they'll do something like write down their BIP39 recovery phrase, but they'll try and memorize their passphrase. And uh, my major, major advice with uh, both BIP39 mnemonics and with BIP39 passphrases is you need to write down both. Obviously don't write them down together, you know, one on the back of the other, but don't simply rely on trying to memorize any of this stuff because no one plans to have a car accident. If you memorize it, you will lose funds. It's only a matter of time. The next thing I'll talk about is SLIP39. And this is one of those standards that Trezor actually launched a few years back. They never really got much traction, but they're really giving it a big push now with the launch of the Trezor Safe 5. One of the big advantages with SLIP39 is it carries over the same simplicity that BIP39 seeds have into a standard that improves some of the shortfalls that BIP39 had. There is an extremely strong checksum, even stronger than what BIP39 used for 24 word seats. And even though the word list for SLIP39 is actually shorter, the words are actually more distinctive. So harder to get confused with other words on the word list. One of the big advantages with SLIP39 is the ability to rework an existing backup into a new multi-share backup. This is particularly useful over the long term in situations where one of the recovery shares might get lost, damaged, or something like that. One of the the other big advantages with SLIP39 for these multi-share backups is that even if someone discovers one of the backup shares, that share on its own is actually useless. And the other advantage of this property of the wallets is privacy, allowing you to spread out your backup over multiple locations without degrading the security of the backup itself. And the other thing is worth mentioning with SLIP39 is you can also use that with a passphrase, adding most of the advantages and disadvantages of a BIP39 passphrase to your SLIP39 wallet. And just like with BIP39, if you're someone who has a multi-currency wallet, your SLIP39 shares will be the single backup set that is used to recover and regain access to all of the different coins and chains that you are using on your device. One of the disadvantages of SLIP39 is it's very important to understand that any new backup sets you create do not cancel or invalidate or revoke old backup sets that exist. So if you would say to move to a two of three wallet backup scheme, you must understand that the original single 20 word backup is still valid. And if you don't want it to be valid anymore, it will need to be securely destroyed. The single biggest disadvantage of SLIP39 as of right now is limited vendor support. Trezor are still the only ones who support their updated version of SLIP39, but there are an increasing number of software wallet vendors that support the standard. And that is always a great thing in terms of at least having a recovery option if you don't have access to your Trezor for any reason. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is multi-signature. Most of what I talk about here when it comes to multi-sig is going to be related to Bitcoin. Because the key thing to understand is when it comes to a sort of multi-chain ecosystem, uh, things like multi-signature vary dramatically from different chains, both in terms of how secure they may or may not be and how compatible they are between different blockchains. Anything you do with multi-sig is really only going to be valid for that specific chain that you create the wallet on. Multi-signature wallets are powerful in its way to need multiple different sets of private keys to be able to generate receive addresses as well as multiple sets of private keys to be able to sign transactions that send funds out. 
Ultisig is also more flexible than the Slip39 in that each of the individual signers can be part of multiple multi-SIG wallets at the same time, as well as still functioning as a single signature wallet independently of any of the other multi-SIG ones. One of the other big advantages of multi-signature is it removes any single point of failure in terms of the individual signers, allowing you to mix and match hardware and software from different vendors to be able to remove any trust or dependence in any one of them. Though before you stop the video right there and think, hey, multi-sig is the best, you do need to understand the disadvantages. One of the challenges, particularly with Bitcoin multi-sig as it exists right now, is that you will pay higher fees when you make transactions, in that all of these signatures from all the different signers also take up more space on the blockchain, so you will have to pay for that. There are implementations in the pipeline to resolve this, uh, but none of those are really ready for prime time at the moment. The other big disadvantage of multi-sig that often gets people into trouble is the additional complexity that it adds to backups. You not only need to keep recovery seeds stored as your backups, but you also need to keep the extended public key for each of those signers as well. All of the extended public keys are normally bundled together in something called a wallet descriptor that you have to keep a copy of along with each of the seeds. And this also leads to another disadvantage of multi-signature. And that is that in storing a copy of the wallet descriptor, so all the public keys with each of the backup sets, anyone who gets their hands on one of the backup sets can have complete visibility of all of the transactions the wallet makes, even though they won't be able to spend from it. And the challenge of storing wallet descriptors in a way that was both secure and private is precisely what led me to create this solution of using the open source seed signer along with the Sato chip seed keeper cards. And the last disadvantage of multi-sig that I'll mention is inconsistent signer behavior. While some hardware signers, things like Jade, Bitbox02, Foundation Passport, Cold Card, so on, will store a copy of the wallet descriptor securely on the hardware device itself and only sign transactions that you know match that hardware descriptor other devices like Trezor don't and they'll simply show you the different extended public keys for each of the signers making it much harder to securely do things like be able to verify receive addresses as well as to be able to securely sign transactions for the wallet and make sure that the multi-sig change you know goes back to the right place though the great thing here is that as long as one of your multi-sig signers is saving and checking the wallet descriptor and making sure that all of the change is all good and making it easy for you to check receive addresses and things like that, you can securely use these other stateless multi-sig devices as part of your multi-sig quorum without degrading the overall security of the whole setup. Just make sure that at least one of the devices is checking this stuff. And look, we could talk about things like paper wallets, but really in 2024, they are a really bad idea. Storing individual private keys is fragile. It's very difficult to do securely. And if you're trying to store individual private keys from your seed-based wallet, you may end up inadvertently degrading the security of your seed-based wallet wallets. So there you go. The most important thing to keep in mind with all of these different approaches to backups is that sometimes it can be tempting to simply go with the most secure, insane solution that you can think of. You know, something like a five of five multi-sig setup, or maybe you want to add like a hundred character BIP39 passphrase to your seed or something crazy like that. But failing to consider the additional risks that you are adding by introducing all of this extra complexity into your backup set. The most important thing to keep in mind is what level of complexity do you think personally you are able to pull off? And then probably once you've answered that question, pick something that is a bit simpler again. Just because in situations like this, it's actually very hard to know what you don't know. And it can be easy to underestimate the complexity of a specific solution. And that's even before you consider the question of whether you want loved ones or other people to be able to access these funds if something happens to you. It's also important to be able to answer the question of what specifically you are hoping to achieve with your specific backup approach. You know, are you wanting to simply add a layer of physical protection to your backup? Are you wanting a specific group of people to be able to come together, let's say if something happens to you, to be able to reconstitute your wallet? Or are you primarily concerned with something like privacy or plausible deniability? Or are you simply storing something that will stay offline in a very secure location for a very long length of time? In which case, things like simplicity and wide compatibility might be your highest priorities. The way you answer all of these questions will feed into the kinds of choices you make about what you use. If you've got any specific questions, definitely just leave a reply in the comments. I do my best to answer all of them. Other than that, stay safe. Thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful. Hit like if you think that other people would find this video useful and hit subscribe if you'd like to be kept in the loop about future content I make that helps people stay safe in the crypto space and to recover if they get into trouble. If you have any questions about this video or a topic that you'd like me to cover, just leave a reply.